Well, good morning and welcome to Good Life Online. We are so thankful that you're joining us today and I'm coming to you from Riverwalk right here in downtown Bradenton because let's just face it, I figured that if you've been working from home this week and staying more indoors because of COVID, why not at least give you a beautiful background to look at on a Sunday morning. Don't get too jealous because as I'm recording this, it's like 100 degrees outside and it's actually super hot. So maybe I would rather be where you are inside, but I just want you to know wherever you are watching this from today, whether it's your home or car or wherever, that we're so thankful to have you apart. We're so thankful that you're choosing to, during this season, remain connected as a church family and share life together. And that's our hope today, that as we continue in sharing life, we're also gonna share in the good news. We're gonna open up the word, we're gonna study together, we're gonna worship together. But let me give you a couple more ways we can stay connected in sharing life before we do. The first is I direct your attention to our website, goodlifefl.com. If you wanna learn more about who we are as a church family or anything else, or maybe you're beginning to feel more comfortable with coming back to in-person gatherings, right there on the homepage, you'll see a link where you can register and sign up and reserve a seat for one of our in-person gatherings. But obviously right here, we're connecting through online and through this online service that we're so thankful for. Another great way to stay connected is by emailing us at info at goodlifefl.com. If you have any questions about who we are, or maybe you wanna find out a question or you wanna help have somebody come alongside you and take next steps in your faith journey, then we'd encourage you to email us at info at goodlifefl.com and we'd love to follow along with you and share with you what it's like in following Jesus or help you take your next steps in following after Christ. In addition, I would point you to social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram. And other than that, and we're excited to gather together today and we're hoping and praying that the love and the joy of Jesus would be on you. And as we worship together, as we study the word, that he would do a supernatural work, that he would unite our hearts, that you should know that as you're watching this today, there's also a group of people that are gathering in person, socially distant, of course, and everything that goes along with that. But we're praying that whether it's that 9.30 service or 11 o'clock service in person, whether it's this online service right here, that Jesus would unite our hearts and together we would worship. So I invite you in today. Let's give Jesus all the glory and church family. Let's begin to worship together. Just one word you calm the storm that surrounds me Just one word The darkness has to retreat And just one touch I feel the presence of heaven And just one touch my eyes are open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that He can't move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. Just one word. You hear what's broken inside me And just one word And you revive every dream And just one touch I feel the power of heaven And just one touch my eyes are open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that He can't move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a prison wall we can't break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. I will believe. 
For greater things is no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like His power. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a prison wall He can't break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. And praise the Lord. His mercy. More stronger than darkness, new every more. Our sins, the amen, his mercy is more. But remember, no wrongs we have done. All nation, all knowing, he counts not their son. Through men to a sea without bottom or snow. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. We sing. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, and do every more, our sins they amend, His mercy is more. can wait as we constantly grow. What Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. And our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. And praise the Lord. Of kindness, he's lavished on us. 
His blood was the payment, His life was the cost. And we stood beneath the dead we could never afford. And our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Thank you for your mercy and your kindness, and your patience and your goodness. Jesus, we worship you for who you are, Lord. It's in your name. people have a love-hate relationship with rules. We live in Florida, the land of sun and sand and HOAs, homeowners associations. Now I'm sure HOAs are, for most of them are reasonable, most of them are probably effective for their communities, but it seems like there's a few that go to extremes. Like the HOA for a guy by the name of Jeffrey DeMarco. He ended up having to pay, after losing a disagreement, he ended up having to pay $70,000 in his HOA's legal bill because he exceeded the number of rose bushes that he was allowed to have on his four acre property. He ended up losing his home to a foreclosure as a result of that HOA battle. Now, rules like that, they make us crazy. And yet I don't think any of us would sign up for a world with no rules. Just last year, there was a group of firemen and their families. They, they rented a vacation condo in a beach community in New Jersey. One afternoon, the second and the third floor decks of the condo, they came crashing down on the front porch. Now, both the decks and the front porch, they all had people on them at the time, men and women and children, and miraculously, nobody was killed. But 22 people were injured. After the investigation, they found that the collapse was was caused because none of the code was followed, in particular in regards to connectors and fasteners between the deck and the house. 22 people were caught in the wake of rules that were ignored. Now, none of us want to lose our homes over rosebush rules, but the next time we're standing on a deck, I think we'll probably hope that the builders were faithful to the rules of construction. Now, our world has rules, and the Bible has rules. The Bible has a lot to say about rules, about what's right and about what's wrong. You know, the Bible has more than 750,000 wor words, and it's the definitive and divinely expired guide to God's standards. However, even in all those 750,000 words, there's some areas of life where the Bible is either silent or seemingly neutral. Those unclear issues where scripture doesn't give us any black and white, it creates some gray. And sometimes those gray areas can become big gray elephants in the room that end up dividing us and distracting us within the body of Christ. And, and more often than not, what I've seen is this, is that where there aren't rules, we end up making our own. And if we do, we typically do our best to end up enforcing those on other people as well. Or we go the other way and we take our freedom sometimes 
to unhealthy extremes. But are more rules the answer or are no rules the answer? We're in a series called You Ask For It, bringing biblical answers to your questions. And this week, we want to address in one fell swoop a group of questions that reside somewhere in the gray areas of Scripture. Either God didn't lead the authors of the Bible to explicitly speak about them, or the Bible appears to possibly be neutral about them. But by and large, humans are a little bit uncomfortable with gray areas. And so in our efforts to alleviate our discomfort, we can sometimes cause some damage by, by trying to write and enforce rules where the Bible didn't, or by taking the freedom that we have in Christ maybe to places that end in heartache. So today, we're going to tackle the question, how should Christ followers handle biblical gray areas? When we mishandle gray areas, I think we make life harder than it has to be for ourselves and for others. What if neither no rules nor more rules is necessarily the answer to the life we're looking for and the life that God wants from us? While the Bible doesn't speak with specificity regarding every belief and every behavior that humans could conceive of, God did provide several passages where gray areas were addressed. Now, one of those passages is in the book of 1 Corinthians. Now, 1 Corinthians is one of the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. Corinth was a port city in Greece, and the people in the church at Corinth were very young believers, not just young in age, young in faith. They were just starting to figure out this whole Jesus thing. And their city was a bustling crossroads from many cultures. Everybody brought a little bit of baggage to their faith because they lived basically in the Vegas of the ancient world. What happened in Corinth stayed in Corinth. And this, this infant congregation is just trying to make sense of, of their new life in Christ. They were beginning to wonder if more rules was the answer. And they were wrestling with a very specific gray area. So let's start in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's go to verse 12. It says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. And then a few chapters later, as Paul begins to conclude this topic, he puts it this way in chapter 10, verse 23. He says, All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. You know, what God has not outlawed, Paul is saying it's lawful. That in Christ, we have freedom. Freedom from the slavery of sin, of course, and freedom from the burden of the Old Testament law that he came to fulfill. But also a sacred gift of freedom that brings a weight of responsibility to it. In the areas where the Bible appears to allow freedom, Paul called the Corinthian Christians to look at any gray area from a different perspective. He gave them basically three questions. Will it be helpful? Just because I'm allowed to do it doesn't mean it's good for me. Will it dominate me? Even though I'm allowed to do something, I should never be a slave to it. I should only have one master, and that's Christ. And the third one is this. Will it build up? Will it build me up? Will it build others up? Well, this decision, it's bigger than me, it's bigger than others, that there's big things involved when you deal with gray areas. Just because a gray area is permissible doesn't necessarily mean it's beneficial. Just because I can doesn't mean I should. So on this foundation of understanding, Paul begins to outline and address a specific gray area that the Corinthians were wrestling with, that they were confronting. Look at chapter 8, verse 4 says, therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there's no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there's one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things and through whom we exist." So here you have this young Corinthian church. They're struggling with the gray area of eating meat that may have been offered to idols in the temples in Corinth. Now these animals would have been sacrificed in pagan ceremonies, and then the meat would have found its way to markets that were located near the temple. So some of the cuts of meat in the market may have been from sacrifices, some may not have been. So Paul makes a point to them that's bigger than the market. He says, what does it matter? He says an idol's not real. Whether humans are, have, have uh, called something God, whether those pagan gods are the harvest, whether pagan gods are over the sea or the sky, these gods are just natural forces 
but to answer to the one true God. So Paul asserted to them that the point is moot. You shouldn't have to worry whether your T-bone steak came from the temple of the moon goddess. But Paul recognized that not everybody would feel that way. Look at verse 7. He says, however, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, they eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Paul makes the point that some people didn't see it the way he did. They didn't have the knowledge and understanding that Paul had. And it never occurred to them that an idol wasn't real. They had been to the ceremonies. They'd watched the impact it had on their families. They'd likely seen a demon manifest the unexplainable, trying to keep people trapped in darkness. So idols had certainly been real to them before they responded to the call of Christ in their lives. So eating meat for those people It wasn't so simple. It took them back to days when they'd rather forget, days they'd rather keep behind them, old habits that they were trying to break. They saw eating meat offered to idols as a step back towards their old life, an old life when they were hopelessly lost and they were so so very far from God. So Paul understood that our position before God is not dangling by a menu choice. Paul understood what makes us right before God. Paul understood the power of grace. Look at verse 8. Food will not condemn us to God. We are no worse off if we do eat and no better off if we do. God doesn't decide our eternal fate based on our menu choices. What we eat or don't eat has no impact on God's love for us. God saves us by grace through faith, not because of how perfectly we navigate biblical gray areas. But Paul's making an important point to the people of Corinth. We can eat or we cannot eat in those areas that God has left gray. Either way is fine. That's not what saves us. We can't save ourselves by what we do or by what we don't do. We're saved by grace through faith, period. You and I and the people of Corinth, we don't have to worry that our salvation is hanging on the contents of our next meal or the contents of our next decision. But that doesn't mean there's nothing to worry about in gray areas. Look at verse 9. Paul says, But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Gray areas really aren't as gray as we think they are. When we remember that we aren't the only people in the world, we have to be careful because there's more going on than just our freedom. We have to take care that this right of ours does not become a stumbling block to somebody else. We have to be careful that the practicing of our freedom doesn't end up harming somebody else's faith. Look at verse 10. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so, by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed. The brother for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience, when it is weak, you sin against Christ. You know, you head downtown to Corinth for dinner. You get down to the heart of the city for a nice meal. You stop at your favorite restaurant, and somebody sees you eating this big, juicy steak that came from moon goddess Bistro. Now, Paul's asking, will your brother not be encouraged to go against his convictions and do something he believes to be wrong. Now, there's more at stake here than just our freedom. By acting on our freedom, we not only run the risk of hurting people we care about, we end up running the risk, verse 11, of sinning against Christ by injuring the brother or sister for which he died. Now, the problem is that we can hurt others with our freedom. In this Corinthian case, eating a steak that was offered to the moon goddess could injure somebody else. And I'm responsible for how my my actions impact others. I am responsible for how my freedom affects others' faith. Our our gray areas are not as gray as they used to be, are they? Seen in this light, we have to handle all of our freedoms with extreme care. We might should handle them as Paul did. Look at verse 13. He says, Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble... I will not eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Paul was willing to give up his freedom in order to protect his faith family. He's saying that if what I can do is going to make my brother stumble, I simply won't do it. 
Therefore, Paul decided to not eat meat that was sacrificed to idols. But that doesn't mean that Paul was taking the gray area and creating a black and white rule. No, Paul was saying that the answer to a Christ-centered life is not more and more rules. So what do we do with all those gray areas where the Bible just doesn't speak clearly? Do we do whatever we want? Let the chips fall where they may, not caring about the outcome in our lives or the lives of those around us? Or do we give up those freedoms and submit to a long list of rules over things that God seems to have intentionally left gray and unanswered? In the end, I believe we should be dogmatic in the areas God has defined and discerning in the ones that he's left gray. But how can we know what to do in the areas where the Bible doesn't give black and white instructions? We have those gray areas in the church, and they can distract us from our main purpose. They can keep us from our primary calling. Things like style of music, the style of music that you'll play in church, maybe what you'll listen to at home, but in particular, the style of music that you'll play in church. Whether it's the debate between hymns or modern worship, whether it's the debate about organs or orchestras or praise bands, there have been worship debates in churches for generations. And on the opposing side of these debates are voices that can't even fathom that anybody believes differently than they do. They're convinced that they're right and their gray area should be black and white truth. But the truth is none of the songs we sing were written by Jesus. None of them were sung by the early church. And the debate about style is a debate about preference. The Bible's clear. Songs we sing ought to magnify God, point people to Jesus, and align with Scripture. But none of those things are questions of style. It's simply people taking a gray area in Scripture and trying to impose their black and white rules on others. Now, the same can be said not only about what you sing at church, but what you wear to church. For some people, you haven't been to church unless the pastor and the usher and anybody you come up against, they're all wearing three-piece suits. For others, if it's not shorts and sandals, then those people, they just don't understand the gospel. The point is this. It's not for us to avoid our personal preferences, but that we avoid taking a sharpie and adding our preferred rules to God's black and white word. You know, it's not just what we wear and what we sing, but also what we do. There's been plenty of debate in the church's history, particularly in my lifetime, I can think about it, of what you can do on Sunday. The Bible talks a lot about taking a day of rest, a Sabbath, and Christians have historically taken that. They've honored it on a Sunday. But your view of what's permissible on Sunday is likely shaped a lot more by your upbringing than by your Bible. Just let me outline a few of the Sunday rules that I've heard during my time around church people. You can play golf on Sunday, but you can't go to the movies on Sunday. You can wash the dishes after Sunday dinner, but you better not mow the grass. You can go fishing, but you better not go shopping. Now, you can read the Bible cover to cover, and I'm just going to tell you right now, you're never going to find any of those specific rules. But that hasn't stopped someone from taking a gray area and writing a black and white rule about it. And it'd be one thing if somebody wrote that rule for their family. Moms and dads leading their kids and the things they're convinced about. But my experience is this, is that churchgoers tend to believe that their way is the best way. And they end up sitting in judgment on anyone that doesn't live up to the rules that they love. But whether we face gray areas in the church or gray areas in the world, what we really need is a framework to evaluate and bring clarity to the gray areas where God has allowed a little latitude. And while the Bible doesn't provide direct answers for all of life's gray areas, it does help to shape our questions. And as we wrestle with whether these are lawful choices are actually helpful to us or to others, we need some framework to do it. So at this point, I'd like to pause so you can find a document on our homepage, goodlifefl.com slash gray area framework. At that link, you're going to find a list of questions written by a Christian speaker and author by the name of Brent Crow. These questions and these verses um, on which they're based, they help to guide us through a constructive process regarding the gray areas of life. They help us walk through what Scripture has to say about them. Maybe it's not directly, but indirectly. And I want to close by walking just a th through a few of those questions with a topic that has passionate people on both sides of the area the topic of alcohol consumption. So let's start at question one. Does the Bible already speak about this matter? Is alcohol use in or out 
of God's explicit moral will. Well, the Bible really has a lot to say about alcohol. There are 200 references to it in Scripture, and there's a lot more positive or neutral ones than there are negative ones. Verses that seem to allow it, like Psalm 104, 14 that says, says, you cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth fruit from the earth, and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen the man's heart. And in Isaiah 25, 6, on this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. So there are these verses that seem to be positive or neutral. And then there's also these verses that contain strong warnings and strict guidelines, like Proverbs 23, where it says, Do not look at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup and goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart utter perverse things. And those, those verses in Proverbs, they tell us why there's a very clear rule for Christ followers in Ephesians 5. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. It's crystal clear. There's nothing gray about it. Being drunk is a sin. God's already spoken with clarity about that topic. But that's a black and white rule within an area that seems to be gray. So beyond being drunk, drinking alcohol is a gray area in the Bible, an area where the Bible gives warnings, but it also gives leeway. So how would the questions that we have there, how would they help us bring clarity to that? Now, what I want to do is walk through my personal response. My background is that I grew up in a context where Christians didn't drink, period. There was no gray area to it from my upbringing. It was enough to say our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit and move on. Now, oddly enough, that rule didn't apply to Krispy Kreme donuts, Chick-fil-A fries, or Chicago deep dish pizza. So as I began to realize that there were some gaps in my convictions, I went through a very similar process to these questions to either confirm or deny the beliefs of my youth. So with our remaining time, I'd like to walk through my personal responses to this gray area. They don't have to be yours. It's my response. And realize we might end up disagreeing, and that's okay. It's what makes the area gray. I just want to, I just want to invite you to be patient and open-minded as we look right back to where we began. The question number five is, will the decision addict or enslave? And the first verse we looked at today says, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I won't be mastered by anything. Now, what the Bible doesn't outlaw is allowed, but that doesn't mean we should do it because we never want to be mastered by anything other than Jesus Christ. Now, the first clue in my decision was probably family background that I saw in my family background, at least on one side, dependence, if not addiction on substances. And I felt led from a very early age to not indulge in alcohol for that reason. That was enough for me. Now, some of you may need to stop at that point, just like I did with these questions. You don't need to go any further. If there's a history of addictive behaviors in your family tree or in your own history, my best advice for you is to stop and steer clear. It's simply not worth it. Now, that enslavement possibility, though, leads to the next question. Look at question seven. Will the decision hurt a fellow believer spiritually or set a spiritual death trap? Death trap. Romans 14, 13 says, Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. Now, I spent almost 20 years of my life working with students in a Christian school setting. I was a teacher, I was a coach, and I was a principal. And then more than a decade in pastoral leadership in churches. And during that time, I've seen so many families destroyed at least damaged by substance abuse. And I didn't and I don't want to set a tr death trap for my students, let alone my congregation members, by my behavior. So I asked my Bible class students one day, I asked them, I said, what would you think if you came in Applebee's and you saw me drinking a beer? And they sat there and they thought, and they said, we wouldn't like it. I asked them why, they said, it just wouldn't look right. Now, John Piper, pastor and author that I highly respect, he reached the same conclusion saying, alcohol abuse is a great evil in our land. I regard total abstinence generally as a wise and preferable way to live in our land. So the bottom line for me comes down to that. And it comes down also to question nine. Does the decision go against conscience? 
Again, back to Romans 14, I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus Christ that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. I know, good life, that for me, it's sinful to drink. Not because it's sinful, though, for everyone to drink, but because God has led me not to do it. That is my response to this gray area. It doesn't have to be yours. But this framework provided a way for me to walk through it to understand it. But we live in a time where more and more substances are going to not only be socially acceptable, but legally allowed. So as the legal standards decrease, how are we going to respond? But what we've talked about through this framework here gives us an opportunity to test everything so we can experience God's best in every area. Now, no matter where you land on this or any other gray area, we can all strive to follow what Paul did across the gray areas of Scripture and in his life. Look at Paul's closing thought in 1 Corinthians 10.31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try and please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Good life. The gray areas of life are not the point of life. We were not saved to be this holier-than-thou hall monitors, enforcing our self-made rules on the rest of the world. But we're also not saved to indulge ourselves in every area where God is allowed a little gray. Life is about more than what we eat and what we drink and how we spend our free time. But whatever we do, the point of life is to bring glory to God. The purpose of creation, we say it so many times, the purpose of creation is the glory of the Creator. And the gray areas... They're no exception. And the best way for us to bring glory to God is to point people to Jesus. When we make gray areas all about ourselves, whether we indulge or abstain, our lives are simply not all about Jesus. So Good Life, let me ask you a few questions as we close. Do your beliefs and behaviors align with God's word in the areas he's defined as black and white? Don't even begin to think about the gray areas for aren't willing to know and obey God's black and white rules. Second, are you living a discerning and God-centered life in the areas that God has left gray? Are you being gospel-centered, seeing how Christ is seen in it? Or are you living selflessly, realizing it's not about what you can do or what you've chosen not to do? It's really all about Jesus. And then are you living humbly? Not believing that your gray area conclusions need to be black and white rules for everybody else. Is every area of your life, is it all about Jesus? At the end of the day, that's what matters the most. Don't take part in anything that could distract you. Don't take part in anything that could destroy others. And spill out your life to know Jesus and to make him known. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, and I pray as we have walked through questions over the last few weeks and as we confront a question today that, that deals with the gray areas, that there would be no gray on our life about whether we are committed to you, that there would be no wavering in us about what's most important, that you would have preeminence, that the ultimate thing in our hearts and in our lives would be Jesus Christ that we would know him more, that we would become more and more like him, and that our lives would point the world to the hope that we have in him. Lord, I pray you'd have us be a people who are willing to set aside our freedoms in order to make Christ known, but also a people who don't establish so many rules that we end up undercutting the beauty of your grace and your mercy. Lord, let us be a people who point people to Christ by what we do and who point people to Christ by what we don't do. And above all, point people to Christ by the way we navigate the process of the gray areas of life. Guide us, direct us, use us in a mighty way this week. In Jesus' name we pray. All right, Good Life, we just want to say thank you so much one last time for joining us for our service today. It's been a great time gathering together and continuing to dig into this series, You Asked For It. I want you to know that if you have any more questions or things that you want to submit, 
Phone lines are still open. You can still email us at info at goodlifefl.com and let us know what your question or topic or thing that you want us to hear um, talk about, whatever that thing is, feel free to message us for it. Other than that, I wanna remind you really quickly of other ways we can stay connected. Again, we just say thank you for being a part of this online service. That's a great way to remain connected. A couple more ways that we can stay connected during this season is, first off, if you are beginning to become more comfortable with gathering in person, then I would encourage you to go to our website, goodlifefl.com, and right there on the homepage, you'll see a section where you can reserve a seat. Reserving a seat is something we wouldn't normally do, but during this COVID season, because of the guidelines in our area, we're only allowed to have a minimum, or a, sorry, a maximum capacity in our room. So we're just asking that you reserve a seat so we can stay within that and be good neighbors, be good stewards, and listen to the local officials in our area. So that's our website, goodlifefl.com. You can also find more information about who we are there. I've already hit the email, info at goodlifefl.com. And feel free to follow us on social media. We're on Facebook as well as Instagram, and we look forward to staying connected together. So as we look ahead to next Sunday, we're gonna continue in our series, You Asked For It. We're excited to dive in, continue in sharing the good news. But as we sign off today, I just encourage you that it's awesome to gather together, but we know that this is so important. But now we go out as a people to continue sharing in the good news and sharing life. So whoever you share life with this week, know that you go as a carrier of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we pray that his power would go before you. Love you guys. We'll see you right back here next Sunday at 9.30 or in person at 9.30 and 11.